Coming up on DTNS, AMC Theaters and Universal reduce the theatrical window. Kodak makes pharmaceuticals and thoughts on the big four tech executives testifying to Congress. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 29th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were uh, just talking about variations in podcast editing. Uh, Sarah getting into mm-hmm, the, uh, the, the video source camera. Our, our, uh, why the congressional testimony made me want tacos. That's all on Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. AMD expects 2020 revenue to grow by 32% on a surge in chip demand as more people work from home. Q2 sales rose 26% on strong demand for Ryzen and Epic chips. AMD reported earnings per share of 13 cents. And revenue from computing and graphics, which includes sales of graphics chips to data centers, rose 45%. U.S. Federal Judge LaShan D'Arcy Hall ordered the state of New York to pay unemployment benefits to four Uber and Lyft drivers who filed for payments in March or April. The New York Department of Labor considers ride-hailing delivery employees, sorry, drivers, employees, but Uber and Lyft have not provided wage data to calculate benefits. The judge ruled the state still has an obligation to pay benefits promptly using data supplied by the workers if necessary. Judge Hall further ordered the Department of Labor to clear the backlog in 45 days and process new applications within 14 days. Forms Smart Swim Goggles has updated its firmware to add support for open water data, things like stroke rate, lapse time, other outdoor swimming info. Users with an Apple Watch Series 3 or later or a recent Garmin watch can integrate GPS-based metrics and heart rate data as well. The update's available now for the Form Smart Swim Goggles, which sell for 199 bucks. Spotify reported its active users grew 29% in Q2 to 299 million subscribers. Paying users, active users rather, paying users of those active users for the premium plan grew 27% year over year to 138 million. Spotify forecast those numbers should hit 312 to 317 million in Q3 with 140 million paying users. Spotify losses increased 76 uh, million euros to a loss of 356 million euros despite the increase in users. A large portion of the loss was attributed to payroll taxes spurred by increased stock price. Podcast advertising rose and Spotify reported 21% of its users listen to podcasts on the platform. That's a lot of growth. Google announced it's making some features of Google One available for free such as the phone backup feature for Android and iOS and a free storage manager tool. Google's also rolling out a new iOS app that lets users store photos, videos, contacts, and calendar events with Google. Uh, moving in on uh, on the old iOS backup uh, thing. See, competition. Turkey's parliament passed a bill Wednesday requiring social media companies with more than a million daily active users, so Facebook, Twitter, etc., to ensure they have local representatives in Turkey, Turkish users' data stored on servers in Turkey, and to comply with court orders over the removal of certain content. If companies don't comply, the new regulations say they'll have advertisements blocked and bandwidth decreased by up to 90%. All right, let's talk a little more about TikTok because TikTok didn't get to testify, Scott, so we have to give them some time here. Yeah, they have to have a little time of their own. TikTok CEO Kevin Mayer published an 800-word defense of the company, which has been accused of having ties to the Chinese government, has been shut down in India, and is under, under investigation here in the U.S. and other countries. Mayer said shutting down TikTok would leave Americans with fewer choices. Uh, Mayer wrote, quote, let's focus our energies on fair and open competition in service of our customers rather than maligning attacks by our competitor, namely Facebook, designed, or excuse me, dis disguised as patriotism and designed to put an end to our very presence in the U.S., unquote. Mayer also announced TikTok has launched a Transparency and Accountability Center for Moderation and Data Practices and will let experts view how TikTok's algorithm works and how moderation is conducted in real time. So a cu couple thoughts here. Uh, smart timing uh, for TikTok went on a day when everybody's going to be talking about anti-competitive -comp practices to put out a big thing, basically accusing Facebook of anti-competitive practices by maligning TikTok. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to solve their problems, but, you know, that's an interesting PR message, and I, I, th I think it doesn't hurt. Uh, and we talked about the Transparency and Accountability Center before on the show. Uh, so a good day to launch that as well to say, look, 
you have questions about how our algorithm works, whether we're going to game the system to, to favor the Chinese, uh, you're worried about uh, stuff getting taken down because it's critical of the Chinese, we're going to let you look at our system and see how it works so you can see that that doesn't happen is essentially what they're saying here. Yeah. It also puts them in a position of saying, well, really, you know, firing an arrow over the bow saying, hey, Facebook, by name, uh, we don't like how you're doing it. We think we're doing it better. And not only that, we're making a unique feature that you probably just want to copy anyway. There's some subtext there about how Facebook doesn't make their own products. They tend to just sort of copy other people's products or buy them and integrate them. And right. that's an interesting stand. This guy's an old Disney executive. He's got some fire in his shoes. He's ready to rock. And I don't know, I kind of like the energy if I'm, if I'm honest. Yeah, I mean, the transparency part of what they're doing is they kind of have to do this. Uh, but it, it's it, at this point, the argument would be, okay, well, your reports that you're giving people is false. Otherwise, this is a it, this is a good thing. This is this is it's goodwill uh, for the public and also you know government officials who have issues with with what TikTok is potentially doing or representing. So yeah, it's uh, it's th they're really going hard on this whole. We're separate. We're open. We're transparent. Oh, and by the way, we're not awful like Facebook. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's what's smart about the Transparency and Accountability Center. It's not just a report of them saying, "Here's what we did." It's we will let you see our algorithm in practice. We'll let you see our moderation queue in practice. We'll let you look at what's actually happening, so that you can rest assured that we haven't uh, colored the data in any way. But the fact of the matter is, I don't think any of that's going to stop the push against TikTok because it's not motivated by those concerns, really. It's motivated by ties to the Chinese. And we have some news that there might be some movement on untying TikTok from its parent company. Indeed. Reuters sources say that investors who are interested in buying TikTok away from its Chinese parent company, ByteDance, value TikTok at a cool $50 billion. Ooh. The sources say that ByteDance has received acquisition proposals from its own investors, including yeah, kind of the big guns, Sequoia, General uh, Atlantic. Uh, ByteDance has supposedly valued TikTok at more than $50 billion. So, you know, might be a little bit of a bidding war here. ByteDance as a whole was valued at $140 billion earlier this year. Oh so, you know, God. TikTok's not the only thing ByteDance does. No, that's a lot. That's a lot. Both both those numbers kind of hit me like a truck today. And who knows? Like it's an early valuation. And Tom mentioned in pre-show that you know that can change and stuff. But still, that is a huge amount of money. Um, but TikTok's a genuine phenomenon. You can we can get all mired mm -hmm. up and in the weeds about all the things we're worried about with it. If we are or if we're not, or if we should be or if we shouldn't be. But uh, yeah, like you can't deny that it's a force to be reckoned with. And I may just get funny dog videos out of it, but. It's a lot more than that. Yeah. If, if I had to, if I had to guess, I would say I expect uh, that we will see ByteDance not want to give up majority ownership of this and instead restructure to make TikTok a wholly owned subsidiary that is headquartered and exists outside of China. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could put it in Switzerland or Turks and Caicos or, or you know something like that and and try that. I think what they want to do is not lose that majority ownership. But it sounds like they're having serious conversations with Sequoia and General Atlantic about going the whole yard and saying, fine, we'll become a minority stakeholder in this. And and that would be the only way to fully satisfy people. Actually, the only way to fully satisfy people is if ByteDance sold all their interest in it. But I don't see that happening at all. Nah, it's too powerful. It's too big of a deal for now, speaking, anyway. Speaking of a big deal. <laughs> uh, Universal Pictures and AMC Theaters have agreed to reduce the 90-day exclusive theatrical window for some movies. The multi-year agreement will let Universal rent, not sell, digital copies of its movies to customers for around 20 bucks. They can't rent them cheap. It's going to be an expensive rental, but they can do it 17 days after the movie first appears in theaters. Right now, the theaters are very insistent that you don't get to do anything with the movie but show it in a theater for the first 90 days. So this is a huge concession on the part of AMC theaters. In return, AMC will get a share of the digital revenue of some sort. We don't know what the details are. Uh, it may be just getting to rent out the movie on its online, online service. AMC Theaters has a video-on-demand service on its website where you can rent movies. So it may, may be that they, they get 
to keep all the money of it there or something like that. We don't know. Uh, it is expected, though, that major blockbusters like Jurassic World comes out of Universal will still have the 90-day theatrical run, uh, that this isn't going to make every movie show up for rental 17 days after it premieres in the theaters. It's more for mid-tier movies, comedies, independents, stuff like that. Uh, not that Universal is independent, but they have smaller uh, indie-like films. Uh, not all theaters are going to play along, though. Uh, Cineworld has already told Deadline, we do not see any business sense in this model. Now, that may be them saying we want to stake out a tough bargaining position ahead of agreeing on this, but it is going to be interesting to see what other theaters do in reaction to this and interesting to see what other studios like Disney and Sony do in reaction to this. I'm not trying to read too into this, but it seems to me this is Universal who decided to kind of against the wishes of their friends at AMC put the movie Trolls out early and in a similar model. It was a you know a fairly steep price, but it was enough. I, 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 uh, Your Honor, I would I think that's a mischaracterization. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the the theater was okay with them putting trolls out. I think uh, I think that when they said that was going to be a precedent is when the theaters got upset. Right. Okay. So that's a good point. Uh, but my point is uh, is deeper than that. The subtext to me is that went really well for them. They made a bunch of money on that movie as a first run straight to digital. Let's go kind of experience. And it was a big movie for families that everybody could watch together and a whole bunch of uh, people watched it. So I think this shifting around is them going, yeah, there probably is some money in the short term anyway if we reduce the days and we put them out for a premium and we get a cut of it. Like, why wouldn't they want a part of that? It's that or you just start watching studios figure out other ways to work around AMC's wishes. So I think that's why they're on board. I know a lot of people are like, well, but, you know, the only reason that, you know, the movies like Trolls, as you mentioned, Scott, did well is because everybody was stuck at home and nobody had any choice. And that's true, except that as as it has been with lots of things that people have discovered during shelter in place times that we're in, some things aren't just going to go back to normal. And the movie theater box office business as it was before is not going to go back to normal either because people are going to be like, you know what, it was actually like way easier to rent the movie. And in order to kind of keep the ball rolling, this makes sense to me that AMC is like, we just got to do it. You know, we got to yeah. roll over on this a little bit because it's, it's just we nobody's really on our side at this point. And frankly, no one's going to movies anyway. So, you know, it's 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 going to be a bit of a process to sort of get that momentum back up as it is for all I, of the theaters. I think AMC said, look, we're not going to have as many screens. We're not going to be able to show your movies as much. And Universal said, exactly. So we can either come to an arrangement where you get a cut of those movies that aren't going to be on your screens because you don't have as many screens, uh, uh, or you can just lose out. And and that that is an essential bargaining position for AMC to say, fine, we'll agree to a shorter window for some of your movies uh, that we wouldn't be able to show anyway because we can't fit them because we've got theaters going out of business. How are they going to decide what the major blockbusters are that still have the 90 day theatrical? Right, run? where's that line? Right, it's Some obvious sort of that like, Jurassic World will not be, but yeah, where, where, yeah like, what, where's the underline that says, well, like, if we expect less than 200 million, is it 100 million? Exactly. Like, yeah, like yeah. what do the analysts predict for you know mm -hmm. worldwide box office gross? Animated movies about trolls. There's your line. <laughs> uh, all right. Next up, Bloomberg and Reuters sources tell Google, or sorry, report Google and Samsung are discussing a revenue sharing deal. It would see Samsung prioritize the Play Store and Google Assistant over Samsung's own App Store and their own Google or their own assistant called Bixby. Uh, Samsung has resisted this in the past, but may be more receptive to its smartphone sales uh, because their most smartphone sales are in decline as it seeks other ways to monetize its market share. So no more Bixby only uh, world for them. Maybe maybe they're onto the mainstream and maybe. Maybe it's anti-competitive in today's environment. Mm. <laughs> well, it, it hasn't been a Bixby-only world. They've always had Google Assistant, but they just prioritized Bixby in the interface and in, and in telling you everything that they had available. This would be a huge shift for Samsung to tell you to use Google Assistant when Bixby's still on the phone. It would be an admission that Bixby is over. It would be an even bigger shift for Samsung to say, yeah, go use the Play Store. It's fine. Uh, you know, our store was always kind of a silly thing. Uh, and and I think that uh, you could accuse Google of abusing its market dominance if you can get Samsung to shift to promoting your stuff on your platform, Android, uh, because they just need the money. Yeah, Bixby. Ah, oh, Bixby. <laughs> 
I mean, it, it, it makes sense that Samsung would be like, okay, you know, let's, let's, let's figure out a deal here. But yeah, given, given the timing of all of this, it is, um, it's somewhat curious. Uh, this is perhaps curious to you. Uh, turns out they've been working on it for a few years. Kodak has obtained a $765 million loan to expand its production of ingredients needed to make generic drugs used to fight COVID-19. A new division called Kodak Pharmaceuticals will take three to four years to reach large-scale production. Kodak filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2012 and shifted its focus from photography to printing and professional services. But Kodak began making drug ingredients back in 2016, something I did not know. Yeah, so uh, th that was something I, I just learned today, too, that they had already begun making these drug ingredients. It makes perfect sense to me, though, uh, that we would see a company who specialized in film, which means they specialized in making chemicals for developing film, for creating mm -hmm. film, uh, look at a declining film market and go, well, we got all this equipment that, that makes all this stuff. What else can we do with it? And one of the things right. they ended up being able to do with it was pharmaceuticals. And now at a time when the United States wants to shift more pharmaceutical production domestically because they're worried about world trade, uh, Kodak stepping up and say, yeah, we'll take a loan. We'll take a $765 million loan and expand that part of our business because that's a way to keep us in business. Yeah, I, you blew my mind today when you mentioned the chemical connection because it just, it, to me, it wasn't making any sense. I'm like, how do you go from cameras to this? Because in my head, it was more about cameras than film. It wasn't about their decades and decades of, film development and innovation in the space of chemicals that make your film develop. And to me, they were more like, oh, no, they make cameras and they made digital cameras for a while. But then it all went away and everyone thought they were gone or whatever. And now suddenly they're making drugs. It seemed crazy. <laughs> You're totally right. Like, think about the not only the expertise involved, but, you know, production and, 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 and capability and whoever's running the thing. They've got experience in making chemicals that do what people need. So what is that if not drugs? So, yeah, it makes sense now. But before today, I was like head scratching on this one. It's crazy. I know that headquarters or Rochester, New York, uh, I have not been there, but I would assume there's an ample amount of warehouse space as well, especially if something like this is going to take three to four years to get to large scale production. I mean, you've got you've yeah, you've got the space. Uh, you've probably got um, a lot of folks in an area where there might be uh, unemployment, you know, uh, big unemployment numbers. And this is it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to do. It's, uh, you know, why not Kodak? Yeah, this is my I mean, when I was growing up, my dad had his own uh, light room. He built it in our house and he would do all his photos manually. And he also did a lot of slides and stuff, which were terrible. But uh, anyway, forget about slides for a minute. But the actual like film developing. I just will always remember walking past that room and there was a certain smell to it. It had a certain chemical uh, quality to everything when that door would open. I would mm -hmm. go in there and you'd see the telltale yellow logo everywhere because every box he had seemed like it was made at Kodak. And so, I don't know, this one also pinched some nostalgic nerves. And I just, I don't know, maybe I'll get a, a bottle of ibuprofen in my, in, my, uh, in my medicine cabinet one day that's got a big yellow Kodak name on it. And then we can all laugh again. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? I remember the days where you know you get a roll of film and it's like if it were it was thirty six rather than twenty four, you were like, yes, yeah. I got twelve <laughs> more photos and one canister, you know. And that was back we've uh, come a long way. A, that was back when a Kodak moment didn't mean popping a pill. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go see Kodak now. Yeah. Bye. Oh, I'm seeing the true colors. <laughs> <laughs> and they're Kodachrome. Hey, ah, folks, yeah. if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes and uh, keep up on tech news efficiently, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. The U.S. House Antitrust Subcommittee called Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, Apple CEO Tim Cook, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, and Alphabet and Google CEO Sundar Pichai to assemble like the Avengers to discuss their market power, which Congress, like Thanos, would like to snap its fingers and make 50% smaller. Uh, in opening statements, Google's Pichai argued that Google exists in a highly competitive market that benefits the average American. Amazon's Bezos emphasized job creation and supporting small business. Apple's Tim Cook claimed Apple does not have dominant market share and has benefited more developers by opening the gates of its app store wider. If I'm a gatekeeper, then I've made the gates more open. Uh, that's actually what he said. And Facebook's 
Zuckerberg said it had more to do with fighting. It had more to do fighting disinformation and argued Facebook has made products it has acquired better and safer. Uh, so how did Congress react? Did they go, oh, those are great arguments. I guess we have nothing to talk about. No, they talked for three and a half hours. And in fact, they are still talking right at the second. Uh, They've been grilling Facebook about buying competitors to stop them from competing. In fact, they had some some pretty uh, headline grabbing emails about Mark Zuckerberg talking about needing to buy Instagram to eliminate it as a competitor, that it was urgent. The Verge has published those emails now. Uh, there was also some questions to Facebook about suppressing conservative voices, although on a couple of occasions they asked Facebook about why Twitter uh, was getting rid of, of of certain accounts, and Facebook just said, well, I, we didn't do that, so I can't tell you about that. Uh, they talked to Google about favoring its own products in search, uh, and as well as suppressing conservative voices, uh, accusing them of delisting or, or, or pushing down in the search results conservative websites. Uh, they mostly had talked to Apple about the App Store uh, and, and whether they were, you know, abusing their dominance by being the only one that had an app store on the iOS platform and being the only way that you could pay for things in the app store. And with Amazon, they talked about driving out competitors, uh, about becoming a dominant retail business. They talked about driving small business off its platform. There was some some audio played from a an Amazon uh, affiliate who said that they got driven out by Amazon uh, and they accused Amazon of boosting its own products uh, and and looking at and even like uh, promoting counterfeit products in order to drive competitors out so they could replace them. Uh, all in all, it's been a very long, more than three hours, almost four hours now, of theater. Don't you agree? I mean, I, I this is a game that was already going on. We knew they were investing. Uh, investigating these companies. None of the issues they've brought up today seem new to me. Uh, there's a there's a little bit of, you know, interestingness with the with the Facebook emails being made public. But those emails still read to me like uh, a company that that is is working hard to compete in the marketplace. And whether or not they show anti-competitive behavior, I don't think was determined uh, in these hearings today. And I don't think it's expected by any of the participants that they will. This is, this is a way to get in front of the cameras and try to sway some public opinion, either to not be so mad at your company or to vote for you in the next election. Yeah. I, I watching the hearing, I mean, besides the, you know, <laughs> members of Congress bickering amongst themselves before anything even got started. Um, the, the, the sort of like, okay, you've got your opening statements from from the CEOs and they're all very dramatic and you know you know heartstring t uh, uh, pulling. And that's fine. It's you'd expect nothing less. Uh, but then, you know, as questions are are pointed toward uh, toward each gentleman in this case, uh, it's funny how there'll be a question and then you get the CEO being like, hmm. Very good question. Let me answer that real slow because I want your your minute to run out. You know, and then you know you've got the you know congressperson being flustered and sir, please, I only have a little bit of time. Let me finish your question for you because I think I'm trying to catch you in some sort of a lie, and it's like not working. Mm -hmm. One of the things that stuck out to me was somebody asked uh, Mark Zuckerberg. You know, back in the day. You had a lot of social networks that you were competing with, and none of those social networks are competitors of yours anymore. And, you know, let's talk about that, shall we? And he was like, well, but we have lots of different competitors now. <laughs> you know, you know, Facebook is the social network, but there are a lot of other new and emerging technologies called, you know, TikTok. Look at TikTok, for example. I mean, Facebook wants people who are creators on TikTok to hang out on Facebook to bring people to Facebook. So, he, and he has a point. I mean, you can't argue that Facebook is any smaller than it is. I mean, it's huge, it's it's crazy. I mean, Zuckerberg is gonna do his best and you kind of snicker at it a little bit, but it is true that the company continues to have competitors. It's not weird that the company would be interested in what the public is interested in, you know? And he was pretty upfront about that. He was like, yeah, I mean, it's not anti-competitive of us to want to be able to deliver a product that people like. And if someone else is doing it, then we're going to put R&D into figuring out how we could also do that too. Yeah, I, I guess my big takeaways are similar to yours. Um, it's a naive thing to say. I, I just wish public hearings meant more than just getting in front of cameras and convincing um, 
either in the case of the tech companies, their consumers, or in the case of the lawmakers, their constituents, that they're tough and cool or smart or whatever. They, that's, there's not enough substance here for me to get excited about. And it really bums me out. Tom made a comment earlier, which I agree with. You're going to have more substantive change or understanding or agreement or whatever behind the scenes in personal conversations and lunch with, you know, one of these CEOs or having conversations with uh, your congressperson in a different setting. I get that, but it bums me out. Like, I just want, I want more out of this. I'm so tied to the tech world in so many ways. And so to have these guys get up there and be questioned like this and have a lot of these questions just be simply like the old fashioned 1950s Senate hearings where it's like, sir, is it not true that you prepare? And you just know where those questions are going to go. And that means they're not going to go anywhere. And the fact that it is kind of just a dog and pony show, more of a Muppet show, to be honest, the way it's running today. <laughs> uh, I, it really makes me sad. Just as, as an individual take on this, it saddens me a bit because I just wish there was more substance to it and it was less of a let's get all the common denominators to be on one side or another. And that, that it was a good it. show. It was a good show. The, the, the real <laughs> stuff happens in the court when they take them to court, when they sue them, that's where the real stuff happens. Uh, the one thing that, that did catch my eye and I couldn't help myself. Uh, I think it was representative gets, uh, who accused uh, Google and later later corrected himself and actually got the story right. So kudos to Representative Getz, but accused them of helping uh, the Chinese military while refusing to help the U.S. military. And I'm like, OK, I, 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 there's some representatives who just make crazy stuff and it's it's not worth paying attention. Representative Getz doesn't usually seem to be one of those. So let me find out what he's talking about. Uh, Shuman Jai is a lead scientist or was in Google's AI team, researched in Beijing and co-authored a paper about new computer human interaction technology. That's the subject here is it was a it was a Google person working with Chinese scientists on something that sounded like AI, but it wasn't. It was using statistical models to improve target selection, which sounds military, but doesn't have to be. Uh, mm. It could be used to improve app interaction as well, which is why Google wanted to participate on it. Also, Google or any U.S. company having its scientists work with Chinese scientists is common. That itself is not a smoking gun either. There's a lot of collaboration happens among scientists there. So the paper was a general research question that used existing statistical models on that. It did not use AI or deep learning. However, it could be used to improve interaction with military applications, specifically a Chinese jet, which we think it was used to improve. And so that's what got Joseph Dunford, then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff upset, is that venture indirectly benefits the Chinese military and creates a challenge for us in maintaining a competitive advantage. And he said they shouldn't have worked on that, even though the paper itself wasn't destined for military use because it could be used for military and because it was done in China and would be taken by the Chinese to be used in whatever way they saw fit. They saw it was, uh, they thought it was a problem. So I don't know. I just couldn't help myself to go down that rabbit hole and find out what the truth behind that accusation was. And I also just, just, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Jinx. Um, I also I yield the before, remainder of my time. Before we move on, one of the things, and I'm really not on anybody's side here. The whole thing is, as you said, Tom, largely theater. But I, I did get a small thrill every time some somebody would direct a question, let's say at Tim Cook, and say, "Now, don't you do it exactly this way?" And and gotcha. And he kind of goes, "No, you misunderstand our business model completely." And then it's like, <laughs> "Oh." Because yeah. really, if both people understood the technology equally, which is just not going to happen, but if they did, then, then there would be a conversation to be had, or you wouldn't have made the accusation in the first place. So it's uh, that's just, you know, it's like when the joke falls flat. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, before we move on, I'm going to pick my star of the game from Congress. I did this for uh, Representative Karen Bass when they did the encryption hearings with Apple. Uh, she won my star of the game for for <laughs> actually understanding encryption and, and actually asking intelligent questions about them. Uh, my star of the game this time goes to Representative Kelly Armstrong of North Dakota for understanding GDPR and privacy and asking uh, very well-crafted uh, and I, I thought pertinent questions on, on compliance and privacy. So good job, Representative Armstrong. Well, many of you may have thoughts on the congressional hearing or anything else that we talk about on the show. And you know where you can have a good conversation about that? In our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. What do we got in the mailbag? 
Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Norm from Visalia wrote in and said, I just wanted to thank you for the updates on the COVID vaccines. In fact, Tom has been doing those pretty regularly. Knowing I can trust your research saves me time looking into the latest status. Ah, thank you, Norm. Yeah, it's a little bit outside our normal purview. Uh, but as I've said a few times, I feel like it's important to, to pass along that good news, specifically focusing on the phase three trials, which are the ones closest to becoming vaccines that could be put into production, or in some cases, they're already in production and used uh, on, on the populace uh, to, to help protect us. So thank you, Norm. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And shout out to patrons at our master and grand master levels, including Jeff Wilkes, Sonia Vining, and Rushan Brantley. Also, thanks to one Scott Johnson, a man I hope will never have to sit before Congress. Oh, and if man. he does, I hope he has a good time. Yeah, well, if I do, hopefully that means big things are happening that, well, it could be <laughs> bad things. Anyway, uh, yeah, thank you. It's always good to be on. And I uh, wanted to just make a, one more quick point out because by the time we have another episode of DTNS that I am on, which will be next Wednesday, uh, we will be out of time. But right now, you've got some 50, what is it, Tom? 48? What are we? What are, what's the number? Hours? I, I don't have it in front of me anymore, uh, ah. but it was 52 earlier today, uh, so it's probably like 47 now. Yeah, probably about 47, 47. or something like that. Uh, if you go to support.current.com, you can support this gr uh, this great new thing Tom and I are doing. The first episodes are already out because we unlocked it because of your support. We funded, but we have other stuff we can unlock, and we still have time to do it. So go read up on it. Get the second episode right away. Uh, get more great content. Maybe there's even an extra episode in the future that you wouldn't get otherwise. All of it's there, laid out in plain English, and translated all over the world, except for the video. That's my, me and Tom talking. <laughs> anyway, go check it out, support.currentgeek.com, and see what you're in for. Thanks to everybody who supports this show directly on Patreon. It's the best way uh, to keep us independent, uh, to keep us moving, keep us improving. And uh, uh, thank you to everybody who supports us. If you don't support us on Patreon, I'm just going to keep playing this congressional hearing and they in fact have until used you that do. Power in ways that we need to root out. That's not kind. <laughs> Congressman, my testimony in the past and today all right, fine, fine. But get over there and support us at patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you have thoughts, our email address is a great way to share them with us. The, UR, the URL, the address is feedback <laughs> at dailytechnewsshow.com. You see what the hearings do to me? We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern at 20.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tomorrow, the committee calls Justin Robert Young. We'll talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>